Hospital. And in 1984, he, was made, he became fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons, and three years later, he was appointed as consultant neurosurgeon at the Atkinson Morley St. George's Hospital, where he has remained, while regularly traveling to Ukraine to carry out problem surgeries to those who otherwise could have not afforded it afforded it and to train the new generation of Ukrainian neurosurgeons. Also in 2010, he has been made uh, CBE and he has been subject to two major documentaries, one called Your Life in Their Hands and the other one The English Surgeon, which respectively won the Royal Television Social Gold Medal and the Daniel Award. <coughs> Last but certainly not least, he earlier this year has published the book Do No Arm, Stories of Life, Death and Brain Surgery which is an elegant series of meditations uh, from a long and successful career. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Marsh here today. Mistakes talk where I review all my worst mistakes and try to learn from them. 
So it was this very transatlantic experience. I stood up and basically said, I'm the world's worst neurosurgeon. And then Spetsa stood up and basically said, I'm the world's greatest neurosurgeon. <laughs> because the, Americans, the American medical system is a commercial system. The Americans take an optimism of tap water and they will not admit to complications in public at all. Um, and yet we are, and I, many of my trainees have been to the barrier, but they are they're terrible disasters there like everywhere else. And when American surgeons stand up and give presentations, it's all, there's nothing about the bad results, it's only about the good results. And, and it's an interesting question, because they do get fantastic results, especially if it gets much better results than I would. I've operated on a few brain stem cannabis and mixed results. But nobody in this country will ever get enough to do to really become very expert. But there's always a price to be paid. And if you think about it, looking at the results of a medical treatment for some, for some very difficult dangerous problem, if you only talk about the successes, it gives you no context in which to understand, is it really worth it? Um, and this is something I'll talk about later on in the talk. So, um, the book, what's the book about? Well, first of all, I wanted to convey to the public um, well, I say surgery is about sport, and um, occasionally um, if an operation has gone well, I'll say to the patient, I really enjoyed doing that, and they look shocked and sickened. Um, there's a big ghastly and that's a nightmare for them. And I say to them, and if you think about it, you know, the last thing you want is to be operated upon by a surgeon who doesn't enjoy doing it. And unfortunately, you might have heard me on the radio a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, now, for those of us, actually not myself, with bottom problems, some surgeons love operating on bottoms. I had, I had to do it for a year because I am old enough to have, have to do general surgical training to get my FLCS. So I had to do a rectal clinic every year on Friday afternoon in Sitka. And I didn't enjoy the experience and nor did the patients. And um, probably, if you know, the results of my various procedures were less satisfactory as a result. So surgeons want to operate. Um, and, uh, but the point is, uh, what makes the operating exciting is your deep concern that the patient should do well. If the patient does bad, and if you damage the patient with their, their wrecked afterwards, there's nothing, it, it, it's a disaster, you're failed. So if your idea is, I'll come on to you next, that surgeons are sort of psychopaths, this isn't really true. If you're, the definition of a psychopath, and we'll talk about that later, according to the Bob Hare checklist, is, is basically lack empathy. You don't actually feel other people's feelings. And if you're like that as a surgeon, then you have no interest in operating. Because the whole point is actually, um, the patient has to be well at the end. So there's no contradiction in, in finding surgery exciting, liking shedding blood, liking to frighten yourself, doing scary things, and brain surgery in many ways is, is one of the most extreme forms of surgery. It's, it's not very difficult, it's incredibly dangerous. So there's no contradiction um, in saying that surgeons love operating and they're sort of bloodthirsty, and at the same time they care for the patients. But it comes at an enormously high price, because things will go wrong. What I've always been interested in is how both I and my colleagues and the people who train me, how we react to it when it goes badly. And so many of the criticisms of doctors and of the medical system is all to do with this problem of, of how, to, how to deal with things when things don't go according to plan and the patient's not better and maybe even worse. And then the other part of the book is really reflecting on, on four decades of medical practice, exactly the same 37 years. Because there have been enormous changes. The patients haven't changed. Everything else has changed. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that because that the medics among you here are setting out on, some of you are setting out on medical careers. And there have been changes in neurosurgery, which I'll discuss briefly. Um, I've changed, I've become older, and you've become negative. You've become, you've got a very influence by what you see as a doctor, and your own health and that of your family as you age. Um, and changes in the NHS. The NHS is a profoundly different organisation from the one I went into when I qualified in 1979. So coming back to what I was talking about um, psychopathy, there is this um, standard idea that surgeons are psychopaths. I was talking to some filmmaker on a Tuesday who, I can't remember how it came up, but he was saying they'd done a paper about psychopaths and surgeons are at the top of the list. In fact, it's not true. 
Bob Hare is a Canadian psychiatrist, psychologist, um, who read that wonderful book, <coughs> like, The Psychopath Test, by, by John Ronson, well worth reading, very good book. And he mentions all this. So the, the psychopath checklist goes to the various um, aspects. There's about 20 different items. Um, and there's given a superficial charm. Well, you see surgeons in private practice, that's rather like that. Uh, a series of unctuous butchers. Um, <laughs> Grandiose sense of self worth. That always gets me off. I, I gave a talk about this to so anaesthetists recently. So I said, Ask those and psychopaths. Of course, they love this because anaesthetists have put up with surgeons all the time. And um, yes, surgeons do probably have a grandiose sense of self worth. Lack of remorse or guilt. Well, what's been particularly interesting about the response to my book? Because I've got oh, hundreds of thousands of letters and emails. Um, many of them from me from surgeons, almost entirely retired surgeons, including some very eminent, so I've worked at the various ways in the States a lot, from very eminent retired American neurosurgeons, who I thought would hate the book on the grounds it's all about, it's very English, it's all about failure and self-criticism and self-deprecation and stuff like that. But a lot of them said they loved it, and they thought it was wonderful. One of them said it's a wonderful book, only a neurosurgeon over the age of 55 will really understand it. Um, so the answer is, of course, I think, that most surgeons, you, you, particularly neurosurgeons, um, you go through terrible periods when, when patients have done badly, you've made mistakes, or things have all gone wrong, but you can't really show it. You feel you have to, rightly so, I don't want me and my colleagues to all go around blubbing and crying all the time. Um, but it is actually extremely painful. And it's been very interesting, but I've got so many letters from retired doctors, all saying they thought it was marvellous, that this, that they all felt this, that they were, so I felt rather pleased that I had actually said things that many doctors, many surgeons felt, but it felt they couldn't actually say themselves. Um, the mission is shallow. Well, you know, if you have a choice, if you, if you want to be operated upon by a surgeon who's calm and, calm and controlled or frightfully excitable, I think most of us would prefer somebody who doesn't get too upset. Um, there's that ridiculous book doing much better than mine on the hands of this, my brain. Or the neurosurgeons, what a visit to heaven or something, something Alexander, some, some American Union neurosurgeon who's got a lot of malpractice suits against him. <laughs> it's true. Who um, fell into a coma, and then when he was in a coma, went to heaven. And he's written a best selling book, it sells millions of copies. It's called The Proof of Heaven, I think, because he had this hallucination that he's there for, because he's a neurosurgeon. We all think neurosurgeons understand everything, which of course is not the case at all. Um, the book is selling very well, much, much to my annoyance. Um, <laughs> callous lack of empathy. Well, it's very difficult. I mean, I, I say in the book, and I, and I talk about various um, things that went, operations that went badly. It is a peculiar torment, which I think is probably only known to consultant neurosurgeons. When you operate upon somebody and, as my juniors tactfully put it, wrecked them or trashed them, the Americans call it. And that happens. Not very often, but it happens. And you have to see that. I mean, they don't die. They're left in a comatose state or dis unable to talk or paralyzed or something awful. And you have to see this patient every day in a wardrobe, often for weeks afterwards. Uh, and you have to talk to the family. And it is extraordinarily unpleasant and painful. And one way of coping with this, of course, is to develop this sort of carapace of seemingly stealing, stealing difference. You can't undo the damage. Um, it's no good sort of falling on the patient's neck and saying, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and bursting into tears. I don't say you're sorry, probably, things like that. But it's, it is extraordinarily difficult, because it? It's not easy. So pity, pity the arrogant, self important surgeon. Um, Failure to accept responsibility for own actions, not a characteristic of psychopathy. Oh, I don't know many. I know one or two surgeons who probably do have a distinct psychopathic tendency. And there are some there are some areas of medicine which are purely technical. Maybe heart surgery is possibly a bit like that. Very fine, very delicate, got off it quickly, put stitch valves in. But the patient died was dead at the end or not. Um, and then they're looked after by the cardiologists. So you can have this sort of practice of operating away without really having to face up too much to the consequences. And also it's all life or death. 
The problem with brain surgery is, is it, it's, it's life or very damaged life, as, as well as death. I worked quite a lot, I worked for a while in Russia as, as well as in Ukraine. Um, and there's a very famous, um, now quite old, neurosurgeon called Konovalov in Moscow, in the Bordenko Institute, who's done, it's like America, and you know, Russia's a big country, and all the patients go to Moscow. So he's done hundreds and hundreds of very rare, difficult cases. But one of, one of his um, junior doctors, who actually eventually left and is now working in America, said to me, he said, it's a very interesting idea that you have, that, you know, quite useful as surgeons actually see their patients after the operation. And the situation in Russia, I don't know if it's changed very much, is you operate, the patient sent, sent, sent out, probably miles away to Perm or Sigorsk or somewhere far away or Irkutsk, and you never see them again. And they're looked after in polyclinics by non-operative neurosurgeons. Well, that's wonderful, you operate, you never have to see the patient afterwards, you don't have to face up to the reality of, of what you've done at all. It, it seems very strange to a neurosurgeon. Again, coming back to the big famous, there are these big sort of Michelangelo, Beethoven-like figures in neurosurgery, more in the past than now. I mean, Cushing's the obvious one, we find it the whole field. Um, and if you develop this big, famous international practice, you get patients from all over the world, and you don't see them again. And you don't see the bad results again. And it's the same problem in this country. Um, the patients who do badly don't come back to the outpatient clinic and tend to sort of disappear. So all, all um, Surgeons, when they go to meetings and hear these famous people giving talks about all their best results, they'll say, Oh, yes, I remember one of his patients I had to look after, everything gone terribly wrong. And in fact, um, the, the American guy, Spitzer, um, one of the patients he talked about, and I say he's a much better surgeon than I am, without a doubt, um, it's all about context. One of, his, one of the patients was an English journalist, with, I, I, not my patient, who went to Barry to be operated upon because I think. See, whoever had seen in England deemed the, the midbrain cavernone to be inoperable. And the patient did very well, a picture of the patient and steps their arm and arm together after the op, and went back, we kind of wrote a book about it, and then had another hemorrhage, because actually Spets hadn't actually removed all the cavernone after all. But as far as I know, Spets doesn't know this, and in, in, in his lecture he quotes this as one of his great successes. So it shows, in a way, that the more you get into an ivory tower, the more famous and successful you become. It's, it's like a Margaret Thatcher lost touch of the Alice or Napoleon or Hitler. It's the same with surgeons. You become frightfully successful. You tend to be surrounded by yes men um, and yes patients. And you often can lose track of actually what you're, what you're achieving. It's a constant challenge to be, to be honest and then transparent. So the problem I'm talking about in some ways is the problem of compassion versus detachment. And you could say that in medicine, obviously, the only ethic is we should only treat patients as we wish to be treated ourselves or members of our family to be treated. But, on the other hand, it is almost impossible to actually treat members of your own family because you're just too anxious. Um, I, I once operated upon one of my daughters, um, Godmar, Godmar, who had a malignant brain tumor. Um, it was a very, very simple biopsy operation. Um, just do it with a stereotactic frame by number that doesn't involve any manipulation or still. But even that, I find almost impossible because I was just so anxious, I was so, um, I try to identify with the patient. And it's similarly, as, as you move up the, through the medical hierarchy, um, you start operating on the drunks and down and outs, and then you get slowly promoted up and eventually get promoted to the short middle classes with private practice. And the final act of it is you end up operating on fellow doctors. And that's the same all over the world. That may sound shocking and cynical, but that's human society. We have an article that is post-neolithic post revolution. Human beings are very hierarchical. And, um, you know, if, if um, David Cameron was admitting my department for a simple operation, I would do it. I wouldn't leave it to the junior doctor who would normally do it. Um, so, you, 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 um, you can't, it's very difficult to operate upon people if you feel very attached to them. And yet, Patients want you to be attacked, they want us to be attached to them, they want us to care for them. And you can care too much. I have occasionally made serious mistakes, which I discuss in the book, where I should have stopped that over-treating people because I find it very difficult to say no, or I find it very, very difficult to sit down and say, look, it's time to die. 
Um, and that's a, it's a huge problem now in modern medicine, which I might talk about later, the problem of over-treatment and not knowing when to stop. Um, you may have seen Ashwin Gawande, whose books are very well worth reading, the American surgeon writer, has just published a book called Being Mortal. Um, I'm, not, I'm not totally in agreement with it, I disagree with some bits of it, but this is what the book's all about. about he calls it the medicalization of death, but the problem of over-treatment. And in America it's a particular problem, that because of the commercial nature of the system combined with, with American optimism. So how you find a balance between compassion and detachment is, is a challenge for all, for all doctors. It's, when you're a medical student, it's easy um, to be involved emotionally with patients. You're not responsible for what happens to them. So you can feel jolly empathetic and sorry for them. But when you become a doctor, you have to start sticking needles into them and doing unpleasant, frightening things, and they become objects of anxiety, as well as objects of our pity and concern. Um, and I think most of us, when we were young doctors, become pretty, pretty immune and hardened. I mean, if, if nowadays one doesn't work the long hours uh, my generation did. Um, and again, one's young and healthy. And it's actually, and although I had this unusual experience, um, uh, with my son had a brain tumor, um, you, you really feel that the patients are a rather separate species from us, the in, inviolable, um, healthy, young doctors and nurses. And as you get older, uh, as I am now, I'm 64, and your own wheels start dropping off and you get prosthetism and retinal detachments and all, that, all these things, you actually realise that, you know, that we're made of the same flesh and blood as our patients. But also, because I am very senior and eminent and experienced, I'm less defensive, you know, I'm more secure about my opinion about what needs to be done. If I don't know what to do, I'll send them off to see somebody else, I know somebody else can do better than I can. So I feel less, less defensive. So in that sense, it's easier to um, feel compassion for my patients. But at the same time, I, if they worse, I feel too, I feel sorry for them, which rather kind of gets in the way. So although, the, in a way, the balance remains the same as it was 30 years ago, the actual content of the show. And you have to appear calm and controlled, coming back to saying the surgeon's right when he said he loved the book, as I actually admitted to what I think most of us feel we don't like to admit to. But you have to be, and you can't, you can't panic. And, uh, and again, you shouldn't go into surgery, because although most of it depends on the branch of surgery. But certainly in neurosurgery, I don't think there's any <clears throat> individual person has a type in neurosurgery, and there are hundreds and hundreds of neurosurgeons, or the pediatric surgeons tend to be more uh, similar person, they're very optimistic, positive drug players, but there are some women who are pediatric surgeons as well. I don't see any single person has a character type in neurosurgery, but you must find risk attractive, you must like frightening yourself, because that's what you'll be doing. So it's a form of sort of stimulating yourself, which has a slight psychopathic element to it, one of the features of psychopaths. Um, is that they need more stimulation than, than other people. They have a sort of low arousal present. And the other problem is the corruption of power. Um, the, the, as doctors, we have enormous power over our patients. Patients, I'm always telling my juniors, you just don't understand how frightened your, our patients are of us. That's a complete alien thought to most doctors. We just don't realize that until you become a patient yourself. And power is very corrupting. You know, remember the famous quote, all power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And the generation of surgeons who trained me had enormous power. Nobody questioned them, they never questioned each other. Um, most of the guys who trained me were very nice and, and decent people. But it is, it is very easy to become complacent and pleased to yourself because nobody dares to ever criticize you. Um, and it's one of the difficulties about this cliche of so-called breaking bad news, which I'm supposed to somehow <coughs> train my juniors with, but you, know, you don't really want to sit down telling somebody they're going to die and have people all around sitting listening in. You know, it's not an easy thing. Um, but again, you get no feedback. It's very difficult. You know, we all, the public are very critical of doctors for communicating badly, and, and many of us do. I'm sure I've done. But the patient doesn't say afterwards, oh, Mr. Marsh, you did that really nicely. Mr. Marshall the crack. So a lot of the time you're, you're sort of fumbling, trying to learn how to communicate, how to talk. I'm told medical students now do get quite a lot of teaching about this. 
But the real problems arise when you're a doctor and you're actually responsible for what happens to patients. And you have to develop this character of, of, of detachment in order to do the work. Um, so it's not easy. Um, and, and one thing you do learn about is it does help getting over yourself. As I say, I want to in the book, doctors can't suffer enough. There's a nice substitute for personal experience. Um, in terms of all doctors would say, once they've actually been patients themselves, been in hospital, it, it's never quite the same again. It gives you much more understanding of just what a vibe experience it is being in hospital, particularly in big, noisy NHS days where all the patients are stacked up like cattle in, in, in the stables. I'm often asked when I talk, oh, what's, what's, what's the next great breakthrough in neurosurgery? What's the future hold? And I say, well, actually, when I look back at the, the 35 years I've been in neurosurgery, the progress has been to make it redundant. Um, some of it. I became a neurosurgeon um, because of Andrews in surgery. I did, uh, as Andreas said, I did PPE originally, and then for various reasons, and strayed into brain surgery in the way one does. Um, and I strayed into it because one day, by chance, I saw an aneurysm operation. I was already a, an intensive care SHO at the time. And I just fell off my donkey. I just knew that's all I'd ever wanted to do, even though I hadn't lasted it until that point. Because um, aneurysm surgery is delicate, it's terribly dangerous, it's rather beautiful, you're operating under high magnification, the microscope is dramatic. It appealed enormously to my sense of, of self importance and everything else. So it then took me, I suppose, about 15 years to become a, a, a relatively skillful aneurysm surgeon. Um, and then in a period of about two or three years, it became completely redundant because of interventional radiology. And I'm, I'm proud of the fact that in this country, um, and in France as well, we, we changed tack pretty quickly. And there were a few aneurysms need clipping, and there were one or two departments left in this country which are still probably clipping more aneurysms than they should do. In America, despite in many ways having the greatest, most high-tech medical system in the world, there was enormous resistance to it. And it took much, much longer, mainly for crude, mercenary reasons, um, before neurosurgeons actually admitted that, that coiling an aneurysm, putting a catheter into the femoral artery, and then putting one of these detachable platinum mini wires into the aneurysm from the inside, is actually much better than drilling a hole in the side of the patient's head. So, it, it, it's been a big advance for patients, that's so bad for neurosurgery because um, neurosurgeons basically sort of measured their self-esteem in crude terms, the size of their balls, or maybe have many neurosurgeons now as well, by uh, you know, doing really difficult angles, and that's what really got the, got the blood up. And that's why mainly, mainly redundant. So, radio, and the other thing is, is what's called radio surgery. Radio surgery is high, um, high intensity radiation, highly focused. So, it's destructive. Radiation. It's like surgery, but with that, it actually destroys what's targeted. It's like, as you, as you probably know, it's like if you imagine lots of spotlights at night all intersecting. The night sky around the target is only dimly lit, but where all the beams of light coincide, it's very bright. Um, and it's exactly the same with radiation, so you can treat small, under three centimeters, well certain, well defined regions in the brain. Um, and the surrounding brain a low dose of radiation. And what that means is some of the very difficult tumor operations, which I now mainly do, in the past we felt obliged to remove all the tumor. And it's usually the last little bit which is stuck to a cranial nerve or stuck to the brainstem, where all the morbidity and damage comes from. <clears throat> and where it requires a lot of skill um, and judgment whether to pull that last bit of tumor off or not. And again, there's a story in the book where where in the chapter called Hubris, where I, I left somebody in a permanent vegetative state because I had pulled off the last bit of tumour I shouldn't have done. But I don't have to make those sort of decisions nowadays. You can leave the last little bit of tumour behind, and then it can, if necessary, be treated with radiation. So as a result of technical progress, neurosurgery in many ways has become simpler and safer, but less exciting for the thrill-seeking psychopathic surgeon. And that's the interventional radiology side of it. Another huge change, um, which you'll find when you become doctors or on the wards, is, is, is patients are older and older. When I went into neurosurgery, one of the attractions of it was that 
anybody over the age of 65 to help the brain surgery. But now we don't know when to stop. And some of the most difficult decisions I have to make is people in the 70s with benign, slowly growing brain tumors, the slowly preventing, potentially reversible by surgery, but then surgery is more dangerous because they're older, they're more, more fragile, they're invariably stuck in hospital much longer, the NHS is desperately sort of beds and resources, so if you treat one older patient, you may well not be able to admit you know, a young emergency next day. Um, so decision making is very difficult. I mean, would, you, would you rather have a dangerous operation or slowly deteriorate over years? I don't know the answer. I had these very long, inconclusive conversations with patients and their families in the outpatient clinic. We also have much more aggressive, the kind of scraping barrel. The commonest tumor in brain surgery is called the glioblastoma multiforme or grade 4 glioma. Um, with aggressive treatment, which means re operating using various dyes, some called 5-ALA, which makes the tumour um, shine a bit. You can put chemotherapy into the tumour cavity. Um, you can operate under local anaesthetic, which I do for more, usually for less aggressive tumours myself. Um, and yet, actually, all you get is people live maybe an extra three to six months um, with by treating more aggressively. And this again is a big it's an existential problem. This is what makes neurosurgery so interesting for me now. It's all these human decisions rather than the technicalities of operating, which on the whole I've mastered the best of my ability and I'm no longer getting any better. Um, are you prolonging living or are you prolonging dying? Uh, if, you, if you add an extra three months, you're going to die anyway. And again, these are very difficult questions and they're very difficult to discuss openly with patients, and it is very important you need to try. Like most doctors would say as they get older, um, what is so endlessly fascinating is, what is, is the people, it's the patients, and the difficult decisions you need to make with them. So what I learned, there I am, was a hospital at the Royal Free Hospital in 1979, and there I am a couple of weeks ago, photographed actually by a professional photographer who wants to put it up in an exhibition of portraits of lesser known luminaries like the Dalai Lama, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a not very good bit. I, I, I couldn't get a video to work, but that shows an aneurysm. It would be nice to show a lovely aneurysm, off, but I can't. Um, so Lord Moynihan was, was a very old, still famous surgeon at the turn of the century. I think it was he, I, I was of a generation that I was brought up to tell you mustn't swallow cherry stones because it causes appendicitis. And the story is Moynihan was once operating on a case of acute appendicitis and found a cherry stone in the appendix and said, the cause of appendicitis is cherry stones. So there's a so-called anecdotal medicine, and that then became the sort of law, we mustn't swallow cherry stones. So what did Lord Moynihan say surgeons need to be? Well, have a nurse of steel, had to have the heart of a lion, had to have the hands of a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I probably rather subscribe to that because brain surgery. Um, 35 years ago, and I'm a chemist surgeon myself. Um, but what you learn, of course, is a good surgery is based on experience, to state the obvious. But the problem, of course, is experience is based on your mistakes. We don't learn much from success, we learn from mistakes. And although we have all these so called morbidity and mortality meetings now, sat in on them in America as well as my own ones in England, they're not, I don't find them terribly helpful. And it's really your own your own mistakes, and being honest with yourself, at least yourself, about your own mistakes, which is usually important. Because knowing when not to operate is just as important as knowing how to operate. Although in one's early years as a surgeon, obviously, your main concern is, is learning how to do it, and your, and your consultant tells you when to do it. And in my experience, I'm sure my own, my own mistakes, not just my colleagues' mistakes, most of the mistakes occur in decision-making, that the ignorant public thinks it's because your hand slipped and dropped something. It's true once my spectacles fell off into the patient's brain. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't do any really harm in the so it was quite right away. Um, but then that really, then very, I can give you very few instances in my career where, where a patient came to harm because of something like that, like a technical incorrupt mistake. So the state's almost invariably have been in a decision where to operate, what to do, rather than how to do it. 
Um, and then you have all the, all the cognitive biases to which we're all liable, the overconfidence, <coughs> optimism, confirmation bias, all sorts of things. So how do you decide where to operate? Well, you've got to know your risk of surgery. And that is the risk of surgery in your hands, not the risk of surgery in the textbooks. And you offer the textbooks so I will underestimate what the risks are anyway. And um, with some more rare problems, it's very hard to know exactly what the risk is. Patients, of course, always think they'll be the lucky ones. If you say, well, there's a 5% risk, you could die, which I tell many of my patients. And they say, well, I'll be one of the 95%. So they have 100% confidence in you, Mr. Marsh. And I say, look, just as you have 100% confidence in me, it does not change the fact. If I operate, there is still a 5% risk. It could be a disaster. Um, and then there's a risk of not operating. So you need to know the natural history of the disease you're treating. And that's particularly important in brain surgery because many of the diseases are very benign and very slow growing. Um, I can show you examples of tumors that haven't grown for 20 years. So you need, you need a very accurate knowledge of, of the natural history. And then the other problem where I've been caught out on several occasions is, is not recognizing serious complications when an operation's gone wrong. One has these emotional blinkers, you just can't accept that something you thought would be fine. Uh, and it's particularly with rare infections, and I've missed several over the years. So I have this lecture I've given all over the place called My Worst Mistakes. That actually is you know, standard practice with medical, particularly surgical lectures now. You start the lecture with a glossy picture of your wonderful big glittering hospital. So that actually is my hospital in the background. <laughs> Um, and then there's this wonderful quote <clears throat> by Fred Surgeon de Riche, who um, was a, maybe a general surgeon, a vascular surgeon, he described the Riche's syndrome, which is claudication of the internal iliac arteries. Um, Every surgeon carries within himself a small cemetery to which he must go from time to time to contemplate. It is a place full of bitterness and regret, a place where he must look for an explanation for his failures. And what I've learned over the years, um, influenced by some of the books I've read, and it's a profoundly important point, is that other people are better at seeing my mistakes than I am. Most of my worst mistakes, if my, one of my colleagues had been about to make them, I'd have seen the mistake immediately, because I wouldn't have all the emotional cognitive biases, which distorts our own thinking when, when, when it's our responsibility. I've learned the importance of thinking slowly, not doing things in a hurry and the importance of honesty, and the importance of good colleagues. Now, to me, these are much more important qualities for patient safety, for good surgical practice, and having the hands of a woman, the heart of a lion, and nerves of steel. And you all ought to read this book. Um, Gabriel was saying he thought it was a business, sort of business book, it's not. And um, Conor was a psychologist, although he got the Nobel Prize in economics, because he showed beyond doubt um, that human beings are not rational co computational agents, balance and utility, which is the homo economicus and economic theory, which I struggled with and also many years ago. It's a wonderful book, all about the way we make consistent mistakes. And the analogy, I haven't got a slide here, the analogy would be with the Muller Lyle optical illusion, where you have two straight lines of the same length. And if you add arrowheads on, one pair pointing outwards, one pointing inwards, we cannot see that those lines are set in length. It is completely hardwired into our brain. We see the arrowhead that alters how we perceive the length of the horizontal lines. Well, there's an analogy. What Kahneman showed with his late colleague, to, uh, Amos Tversky, is that uh, we make similar consistent mistakes in particularly assessing risk, probabilities, and judging other people. An example of that is called the halo effect. If you like somebody, you tend to think they're going to be good at everything, every aspect of them. And as a very important part of being a senior surgeon is training. And I had to decide at what point uh, my juniors can operate and operate on their own. And it's obviously a huge transition, like learning to fly an aeroplane. Every day you've been doing it for hours, you've got an instructor next to you sitting, sitting with his arms folded. But one day you're going to fly an aeroplane on your own, and it's a totally different experience. And surgery is, is not dissimilar. And I have to decide um, at what point my trainees can operate on their own, or at least for me, in another room. And again, looking at my mistakes, I occasionally made serious mistakes in that regard. 
due to this halo effect, this bias, I liked the trainee and I overestimated their abilities. And this an example just from last week is an example of the sort of problems we face every day in neurosurgery. It's slightly unusual one. It's not my patient. Um, this is an example of where I, I thought my colleague had made a serious mistake and I would have pointed out that time we could have done. It's a young woman, short history of headaches, comes in a fixed, unconscious and deep coma with both her pupils fixed and dilated. Now in general terms, we know um, that if you've got fixed dilated pupils, you're only a, you know, a short distance away from death and from respiratory arrest because it means that the, the um, nuclei for the third, third cranial nerves, the nuclei making a vestibule in the brain stop working. And that's a rapid and progressive process downwards of steam in the brain stem and the respiratory center will stop shortly. Most of these patients get intubated and put on ventilators. So um, they're still alive, technically, when they pitch up. And looking at that brain scan, um, say one slice out of several, but what's striking the brain, you say it's very tight, the brain's very swollen, there's all this dark, dark area in the brain, which is unusual. And looking at that, I was pretty certain, except it's rare, but I've seen similar cases, it's a terrible tumour called gliomatosis cerebri, where the whole brain is becoming expanded by a tumour. And some of these patients, although the tumour must have been growing for, for months, um, will then deteriorate and die very quickly. If any of you have seen that, that film with the English surgeon about me in Ukraine, there's an incredibly beautiful young girl who walks into the office with a brain scan like that, although she's still alive and well. And she died more slowly, she went blind from pancreatoma and then died over a period of months. But this patient was about to die, but, and my colleague said, well, we must operate, because we don't have a diagnosis. I mean, it wasn't absolutely certain to be glyomatosis, and we don't probably don't have a diagnosis, we don't know, she might know, we don't know if she'll make a good recovery or not. We just don't know. On the other hand, we also admitted, we do know that the chances of a good recovery are very small. Um, in fact, vanishing is small. Um, and the question then is, how many bad outcomes are justified by one good outcome? And we face this problem with severe head injuries. We can't predict the prognosis very accurately. Um, and if, and we'd all say, well, if, if you have a thousand cases like this one I've just shown you, and if only one, if you treated them all, and only one person made a good recovery, but 999 did very badly, and maybe died very slowly and horribly, most of us would say, that's not a price worth paying. But the problem is, where do you draw the line? 999, 998, 150, 49, very difficult. Anyway, so they operated, and we did what's called a decompressive craniectomy. So you can see the black, the black U-shape is what's left of the skull, and the whole of the front, the whole of the front of the um, skull has been has been removed to allow the swollen brain to expand. So um, she became semi-conscious afterwards, and her pupils started reacting. They did a biopsy; it came back as glyomatosis. But the DWI, the diffusion weighted scan afterwards, shows she suffered bilateral posterior cerebral artery infarction, which is a, <clears throat> one of the consequences of raised intracranial pressure. And the process called cerebral herniation. They then had to put the bone back on again, because otherwise if you, um, if you have a large brain tumour and your skull's been removed, the tumour gradually sort of grows out of the skull. And it's a terrible death, it takes a long time. So it's clearly a pretty terrible mistake, actually. Um, she's going to die. She's going to die slowly now, miserably, completely cortically blind um, because of the cerebral infarction. And I'm, I'm pretty sure um, my colleague won't make that mistake again. If he ever sees a case like that again, he probably will say, well, it's better to let her die. But that's something which only comes in time. It's very difficult as a junior consultant to make these ruthless decisions and then live with the consequences. And you have to have had terrible problems like this in the past to have the strength to make that decision. And of course, if you have colleagues who, and this, if the trouble is these cases often come in at night, if, if I if should come in in the morning, I would have tried very hard to persuade them not to operate. But again, it's an example of the way um, discussion, <laughs> good colleagues, that it's incredibly important to state the obvious, but that's not the 
the surgical model, which I was brought up on. It certainly wasn't the surgical model which Lord Moynihan was, was brought up on, where individual surgeons were his godlike figures. But just to balance it, I make terrible mistakes too. You won't really understand what that shows, but as a woman I operated on for a benign condition called cerebellotopia, where the bottom of the brain is stuck in the, in the foramen magnum. The operation went incredibly well. She was home within two days. I was very pleased with myself. And the husband rang me up a week later to say she was a bit ill. Um, and because it was on my mobile phone, I was thinking about something else. I said, oh, don't worry. She'll probably get better takes and pills and come and see me if she, if she gets worse. And then she got very worse. She came to see me. I got a scan. And because I just was not able to see clearly, in fact, uh, in front of the brain stem is this black area, uh, which shouldn't be there. And she, in fact, had an incredibly rare infection. I've never seen it before or since. A streptococcalae, subdural empyema, that's pus around the brain stem. And because of my delay, and the fact I couldn't, I didn't see, because I didn't see what was in front of me on the scan, partly because it was so rare. She, she was left terribly disabled, totally wrecked, and I told them to sue me, because I thought it was my mistake, and the settlement was in fact six million pounds, which is the cost of a lifetime nursing, well, 40% goes in legal expenses, of course, but um, that's the cost of a lifetime nursing care. So, what, on the other hand, now, of course, I've done hundreds, about a hundred of these operations before that particular complication. Now, when I do this operation, I'm all terrified afterwards. <laughs> if any problems afterwards, I'm terribly anxious that I've got a, 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 a rare complication. So, it's difficult to to find a balance. If you can't spend the whole time wiring your patients, you're going to get terribly rare problems and investigate everything just in case. So again, you have to strike a balance. And I made this point earlier, a lot of my most useful learning has been from my own experiences, my son with a brain tumor, uh, myself with bilateral retinal detachments, my wife with Crohn's disease and epilepsy, nursing my mother through her fine illness. These are invaluable experiences, and they make one a slightly better doctor, because it gives you some idea what it's like to be receiving in. Because it's very easy, it's so easy in modern medicine, to lose sight of the patient. There is actually a patient there, buried somewhere, um, and it's a severe head injury. But it, it, it's a power corrupts, we can get over detached, and finding that balance between compassion and detachment is um, so important. Another aspect of this um, is, is to do with severe head injuries or hemorrhages. Um, we often admit patients often at night with severe, with severe head injuries. Where if we operate, maybe doing decompressive craniectomy, as in the case of a tumour, or remove a blood clot, the patient will survive, but will certainly be left disabled. There's also a, a fashion now for operating upon patients with large strokes, non-hemorrhagic thrombotic strokes, to do a decompressive craniectomy. So the infarcted, swollen brain will be able to spread out of the skull and reduces mortality. But the patient will certainly be left disabled. And you can have two sorts of conversations here. You can say, as it tends to happen, I think, and I'm also trying to knock it out of my juniors, he will die if he's going to operate all over left disabled. He's a tantamount to saying, do you love your loved one enough to look after them if they're disabled? Which everyone will say, of course, you can't operate. Um, it's totally unfair, to, in a sense, to, to put that question in that way. Whereas what you should say is, would he want to survive disabled? But the problem with that is, it's a much more painful conversation. And it's not a conversation you can have quickly. This was a severe head injury, the son of a very, very, fact, a very famous um, newspaper magnate. Um, he was walking across the zebra crossing with, with a listening to his iPhone and got run over. That's only one slice, but he had, clearly had diffuse brain damage and was in a coma. And if I had done a decompressive cranium to him, he probably, probably would have survived. And he almost certainly would be left very disabled. I mean, not absolutely certain, but very probably. So I had a long, I had a long conversation with the family. It went on for an hour, like a conference, very difficult, very painful. Then, in a sense, I have to say, well, actually, in my opinion, you have to, I have to ask people to trust as if, in my opinion, probably, we shouldn't treat him. But if, if you were younger, it's more difficult because you feel less, less certain. Um, but this is not a lesson guy, and as far as I can tell, that's the right decision because you don't know. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and the other thing I've learned, just to finish quickly, is that hospitals are big institutions, 
We ought to, again, as part of your general education, we ought to read the book Asylums by Irving Goffman, um, who's an American, uh, Canadian um, sociologist who spent a year slightly incognito, and in fact, in long term psychiatric hospitals as an auxiliary nurse. And much of what goes on in hospitals is about the way hospitals are total institutions and what goes on in them, although often ostensibly for the benefit of the patients, often isn't. I mean, hospitals are very much like prisons. Why are they like prisons? Well, when you go to a hospital, when you go to a prison, your clothes are taken away, your possessions are taken away, you're given a number, you're put in a small confined space, and then you're subjected to a rectal examination. <laughs> I rest my case. So, why the hospitals are so horrible? And even the statues throw up their hands in horror. <laughs> That, that actually is, is was St. George's. They haven't moved that statue now. But, but on the hospital, the horrible environment architecture, that's another lecture which I won't dwell on. That's just a joke. I, I worked for a while in the Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg um, on the banks of the Neva. And the view out of the hospital windows, my favourite hospital view, is the Christie Prison. That's a Russian prison there. And on some days, you can see always heavily to two convicts doing sort of press ups and chin ups in the exercise yard. Which is a very novel view from the hospital window. Um, I'll stop, I won't talk about the NHS, it's a long subject. Um, worth pointing out that the problems of healthcare resources are not unique to this country. It may be saying it goes up to 2008, but all over the modern world, healthcare costs are accelerating up and up and up for a variety of reasons. In America, it's particularly severe. So the problems of the NHS are not, not unique to the NHS. Um, my book was, was serialized in the Times. It's called Confessions of a Brain Surgeon. The book is not a confession because I'm uh, intensely proud of what I've done and of my work. Um, neurosurgery has changed profoundly in the years I've been doing it. I would never encourage anybody to do it because it's very, in many ways a very grim job. Uh, and it, you, you can only find out if it was suited to it by maybe working as an SHO for a while and seeing the nature of the work. But it's not all planned or as high tech operating by any means. But it is endlessly, endlessly interesting. And by my stage, you're also interesting in all these ethical, moral problems you face in the decision making. And if you ask what I'm proudest of, I innovated various things like the weight craniotomous and tumors. But actually, what I'm proudest of is this I was responsible for creating this balcony garden because the, balcony, the patients were banned from the balconies because the management said all the patients would want to commit suicide. So I had to raise, which I think is true, so I had to raise £130,000 charitably to get the parapet made twice as high. And it's actually, although lots of hospitals have gardens, they're usually miles away from the wards. But what's nice about this one is that the, this, the gardens are directly outside the wards and the patients can go and sit there. And they love it, and the staff love it. And it's really very nice, and I'm very proud of that. I fear it's going to get removed because the hospital wants to build on it, but um, that battle hasn't been lost quite yet. And the patient there, in fact, has that tumour, it's a rare pineal tumour. Um, very nice operation, I love doing pineal tumours, a little technical challenge. One of the chapters in the book is about operating on pineal tumour. But the fact of the matter is that tumour has not changed in size in eight years. And all I've had to do is treat the hydrocephalus, the obstruction of the spinal fluid for tumours caused. So again, it shows how knowing, and she's had eight good years, she might need to have an operation one day. We've postponed it, it's had more than eight, that's ten years. The children are now grown up, more or less, um, and it's a triumph of non, non surgical management. And in many ways, that's just as much an achievement as, as doing a clever operation. And at that point, I'll stop. Thank you very much.
Okay, look, looking back at your whole career, um, if you could uh, do anything differently, what would you do? Um, well, it, 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 neurosurgery has changed a lot. Um, I mean, the future of neurosurgery, in terms of what's going to be interesting, in terms of operating is a dysfunctional work. Um, and computer brain interface, things like that. But this is immensely expensive. And uh, Maine is going on in America. Deep brain stimulation, they say functional neurosurgery is, is less than a sexy than the sort of surgery I've been doing over the years. But um, if I was starting over again, and I didn't know if I'd be into neurosurgery, I would try to make I tried to work along those lines. In terms of regrets, well, the main regrets are all the patients I've wrecked over the years. Um, so, in terms of the way my career has progressed, I've no regrets. I've been very lucky that I've worked a lot abroad. I've worked in America, um, Eastern Europe, elsewhere, and that, uh, that, that's very nice. One of the great benefits of being a doctor is if you want to combine travel, true, if you've got true travel and meeting locals and being useful, medicine's very good. It's very useful for that point. And that's been very cool. No, no, no big regrets. Just put your hand up. Yes? Um, you talked uh, <laughs> uh, talk, uh, a fair bit about the sort of ethical dimensions of uh, neurosurgery. Uh, just in your opinion, is that is that something that trainees today are getting enough of? Is that probably, probably not. I'm retiring from clinical practice in this country next year. And I've been persuaded to carry on in a purely teaching role. Well, I'll go and work in Ukraine. I'll be working in Nepal to Kathmandu next year. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to sort of plan a, a sort of teaching program for my trainees at St. George's, where we'll discuss particular cases, but trying to deal with, the, with these quite complicated ethical, ethical issues. Um, I, as far as I know, there's very little of that. At a, at a graduate, at a postgraduate level, and I think there should be more um, because it is such a, it's becoming an increasingly important part of medical practice. And this problem of overtreatment and expense is going to dominate medical practice increasingly. And even if you know we suddenly come up with a cure for Alzheimer's and a cure for brain tumors, we're all going to ever going to die from something else. It's always very difficult to know when to stop. And I think this needs to be discussed more explicitly. So I, I hope to do some more along those lines. Whether I spread it out beyond my immediate department or not, I don't know. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, with the um, increase in arguments for and against so euthanasia being attacked all of that, do you think that surgery will become more of a risk-taking business as in I'm going to what happens, we just euthanise them. Quite, or be afterwards, after the operation, like a vet. Yeah. And they can go out and I actually had the world's first batch of brain surgeons, another story, a batch was found confused and wandering in Epsom Downs, and there was a local vet, it was one of the four neurological vets in Britain, who said, oh, let me talk to you. They got a brain scan. Some animal charity was on the TV, paid for a brain scan. This badger had rather large ventricles. So they look, maybe it's got hydrocephalus, so clear this pressure, this vet, neurological vet, so we don't come and operate on the hydrocephalus. The only problem is I did, my endoscope is a bit bigger than the badger's brain, and it didn't do well, but then yes, the thing is, it was probably I operated on a girl and retriever and something else once, so I can't remember. They all did very badly. But the advantage of veterinary work is you can, although the owners are very upset, you can drop them in the bin afterwards. Um, is that your suggestion by attacking the human surgery or not? Or all... Is that your suggestion by what should happen if human surgery will operate and there's a good result, you just kill the patient afterwards? Yeah, with human surgery, just like you said, um, at what point should you just avoid surgery? Well, do you think if we have the option of euthanasia afterwards? Of oh, direct euthanasia in this country, we don't. Um, the, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in euthanasia in the form of so-called doctor-assisted suicide. Um, and there are various ways of doing it. I mean, in, in Holland, Belgium, and Switzerland, 
Um, you've got to have an informed, you've got to have informed consent. You've got to have a, a, a competent mentor's patient with mental capacity to, to say that's what they want done. Um, and if, sure, I mean, many patients have told me before or not, if, if it goes badly, if I'm just left to vegetable, I don't, I don't want to survive. And although you can't actively carry out euthanasia by not putting them on a ventilator, by not treating a chest infection, you can ease the passing as the phrase goes. Um, in terms of euthanasia, generally in, in Holland, Belgium, and Switzerland, in, intractable, hopeless suffering is, is regarded with, with the explicit wish given by the patient, right, with two doctors confirming that, um, of grounds for euthanasia. You may have seen a couple of years ago, there was a young Englishman who had been left quadriplegic in a rubber injury and was utterly depressed. Um, and he went to take the test and, and was and died. Um, in this country, the Lord Falkner's bill, which I actually to the House, the House of Lords, House of Lords tomorrow, is the same as an Oregon, um, Maine and, and Washington state in America, which you have got a terminal prognosis of six months um, to qualify for the euthanasia. And if you look at, look at the figures from these states, in fact, most people who sign up for it don't then actually take advantage of it. In other words, it's a reassurance that if things really get horrible, you know, I can die comfortably and quickly, which is what people seek. And as the end approaches, in fact, people slightly, slightly change their mind. Um, the real problem, of course, is, is dementia, which is you know, a huge demographic problem in Western society. And there really, well, euthanasia isn't an answer there because demented people can't give informed consent to euthanasia. And although you can leave what I've done, maybe you ought to, you're probably not at your age, I suppose, you're more optimist still. Um, the, the advanced directive for our written down has been witnessed that. I don't want life-saving treatment if there's anything less than 95% chance of getting back to a, an independent life. So I suppose with dementia, if people get severe pneumonia um, and they have an advanced directive, then it's easier for the doctors to not to treat it. But the problem is, there's this built-in bias, it's always easier to treat than not to treat. If you don't treat, you have to have a long, painful conversation with the family and relatives. And it's painful. One tends to avoid it. It's much easier to operate or hand out the pills and not actually get to roots of the problem. So I hope, I hope assisted suicide becomes possible in this country and there are lots of opinion polls in the public are generally in favour of it. And it's a very small, I think mainly Catholic minority who are passionately opposed to it. But I mean, Holland is a strong Catholic church, as does Belgium, and they have no problem with it there. So it's not, not purely a, a religious issue. Waiting for him to walk to the other side of the room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> back. you excellent talk. Thank you very much. Are you in another world when you decided to follow your PPE path? Yeah. And you suddenly found yourself a Secretary of State for Health. Yeah. Knowing what you know now from your existing career, what would you do? Oh, I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's. It's like I left out the NHS because there's been quite a lot about the NHS in the book. It's not about the NHS, it's about the stupidity of bureaucracy. Um, the NHS is not the envy of the world because there are lots of other countries which have essentially state-funded healthcare, which works equally well, most of Europe does. So it's not unique. And although the American medical system has many major problems, above all expense and inequality, they do have socialised healthcare, up to the age of 16 and after the age of 65, healthcare is free, funded by the state. So it's all, it's all very complicated. Um, the trouble is, the more you spend on healthcare, the more it costs. You build more ICU beds, the doctors, less their consults, but admit more elderly patients with the worst prognosis. You know, so it goes on and on, it's very hard to know where to stop. You could spend the entire national income on healthcare and the entire population would still die. So you have to make decisions where to set your, set your, your level. Um, I think it's reasonable to think in this country the NHS is underfunded at the moment and ways need to be found to, to put more money into it. But um, 
a lot of that's about a lot of that's about geriatric care, nursing homes, things like that. There's, there's no easy answer to it. There's, there's been vast sums of money without necessarily actually achieving very much. And it's generally said that the main reason for increased life expectancy um, is, is public health and proper drains and things like that. It's not actually high tech modern medicine. But I would, I mean, I personally would favour, I think, what's called a hypothecated tax, that people would actually pay a tax for the NHS, and they could see what was going to the NHS, and they might be more willing, therefore, to pay more tax. But the Treasury has always been passionately opposed to it, because they're then worried, well, if they get an hypothecated tax for the NHS, people then want to tax for education, or for the army, and this, that, and the other. But they've got to find a mechanism whereby more money is put in, and the problem is politicians don't want to raise taxes, so they won't win the next election. So they're caught between a rock and a hard place of, of trying to avoid putting up taxes, but constantly being criticised for the, for the way the NHS fails. The NHS is the largest healthcare, or healthcare organisation on the planet, I think, and you know, any one person has to have a problem. It's seen as a reflection on the NHS as a whole, which of course is hidden, and that's to do with the very poor quality of tabloid newspapers. Country. I mean, yes, we need a, an aggressive investigatory press. I hate the press to be repressed in any way. But it's, you know, every time uh, there's some medical problem, the tabloid headlines, there's a scandal, or there's a cure for cancer. Because what sells newspapers is bad news or miracle cures, and that's what the headlines said. And the politicians are driven by tabloid headlines. They always kind of chopped up with. Rebecca or Brooks and, and Rupert Murdoch and all that. So they're hugely influenced by the capital press. But it works. That's one of the problems the NHS has. We're going to be able to take the last few questions now. If there are any more. So, what uh, scientific advancements within the next century <coughs> would affect the nearest overview the most? The, um, the commonest grotty problem. In, in neurosurgery, malignant brain tumors. I'm mean, rare compared to breast cancer, lung cancer, gut cancer. So, um, a, an effective non surgical treatment for malignant gliomas would make a big difference to the practice of neurosurgery. I don't see, as I said, progress in neurosurgery on the whole is to make neurosurgery redundant. Neurosurgery is very crude. Um, I mean, the ratio between my smallest, I haven't got the slide, but I've got a slide showing pinhead in front of the bulldozer scoop, which is roughly a slight exaggeration. The ratio between my smallest microsurgical suckle, which is two millimeters internal diameter, and, and the individual neurone, which is 40 <coughs> microns. So it is by its very nature crucial, all cells are small, but obviously the, the, the brain is, is information packed in. Um, so progress in neurosurgery is to make surgery unnecessary and crude. I don't see, I don't think you could actually and people are using robots for prostate surgery, though nobody knows actually if it's making a big difference to outcomes um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but operating at high magnification, you can't get with hand to the trim. You can't operate with one operating microscope. I, I love my operating microscope, but I couldn't operate at more than about 10, 10, 12 times magnification. Whether a robot would really make a big difference, I rather doubt, because the difficult problem is that how hard you pull. And although I think the newer robots have these little haptics, where you get some sort of feel in a, in a glove, at the moment it's not a very good substitute for, for one's own hand and brain. And so I, I don't think robotics are going to mean you can do much more delicate operations. On the other hand, more um, miniaturized intravascular procedures made possible. I was just reading on the net this morning about some new heart device that will feed this. Feed this um, mechanical catheter to make a hope to do the home and heart operation through a blood vessel rather than the opening the heart and chest up. So there may be some progress in that regard. Madam if I'm now enough. Um, it's quite a generic question yeah. um, but I thought it was the last one that would be okay. Um, what's your advice to anyone going into the field of neurosurgery, neuroscience, um, or oh, you going need, to be a doctor? You need to go and do a, you need to get a six-month job. I think there's still less HO jobs then, then. 
in neurosurgery, you need to go and do it for a few months to get a feel of what it's like. Because although a lot of it's exciting and dramatic, a lot of it's about dealing with people with brain damage, head injuries, tumors, things like that, perhaps it's actually quite depressing. So you have to find the, the surgery, the diagnosis, very exciting and involving to compensate for the downside. And that you can only, that you can only find by doing it for us if it suits you. I mean, I rather lost track of all this run through training and everything nowadays, but when I was when I was going through you had to do four years of, of general surgery, A and E, things like that before you specialised. So you moved around in lots of different jobs and you'd actually find what really what really suited you. I think it's a bit more difficult now, and then you have some national selection and you see if you have a steady hand or something. And you're talking <laughs> actors pretending to be patients. Ostias, whatever they're called. No, I think you need you need to um, is it, is that the, the, um, you need you need to go and do a do a junior job to see what it's like for more than a few weeks. Is that it? Am I run away? <laughs>